Let's go ahead and get started. So today we're going to be talking about chapter 18, and 18 is the start of our lectures where we talk about all different types of infectious diseases. Okay? Uh, your book breaks them up based on body systems, okay, or organ systems. And so today we're going to focus on diseases that target the skin and the eye. Okay? All of these chapters will be set up in a similar kind of way. Um, we're first going to talk briefly about the anatomy. Then we'll talk about normal commensals found in the area, then defenses in the area, and then we'll just go through a whole bunch of different diseases, okay? So, a little bit about the anatomy. Now, I'm never going to test you on the anatomy. I just like to talk about it to make sure everyone's on the same page. So when I start saying things, everyone knows what I'm talking about, okay? So we're going to start with the skin. The skin is made up of three layers, the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous layer, okay? The most superficial layer is the epidermis, and this is where you have that dead keratinized skin layer that I mentioned earlier, okay? This is a rough, kind of uh, hard to penetrate surface, and this not only protects the skin, but also protects your body from many infections, okay? So this is uh, one of the biggest defenses of the skin area. Below the epidermis, you have the dermis. The dermis is usually the largest portion of the skin, so the largest layer. And then here you have all of the accessory organs, as well as uh, blood vessels and neurons, okay, or, or nerves, I should say. <clears throat> the accessory organs are the hair follicle, where hairs come out, as well as sebaceous glands, which secrete oil, and then sweat glands. And then below the, sub, uh, below the dermal layer, you have the subcutaneous layer, and in here you have adipose tissue, or fat, and then larger blood vessels. Okay? Generally speaking, with infections of the skin, the more superficial they are, generally the milder they are, okay? Uh, so mild skin infections will happen on the epidermis, and then as they make their way further into the dermis and then the subcutaneous layer, they become more and more serious. The main reason for that is, is you'll note that in the dermis and subcutaneous layer, you have uh, a lot of blood vessels, and so the organism may potentially get into these blood vessels and then can disseminate throughout the body. So, as we mentioned before, the skin has got this really rough, kind of uh, hard to penetrate area, and this is the epidermis, and this is important because the skin makes contact with organism on a regular basis, right? Uh, your skin is pretty much always exposed to the environment, and any time any part of your body is exposed to the environment, it's being bombarded by a potential pathogen, okay? Uh, uh, when you do get an infection of the skin, it usually occurs due to some sort of break or microtrauma in that epidermal layer. Then once the organism gets in, it often causes a localized infection, which means it stays in that one area. Okay? This often results in an eruption or an opening up and kind of oozing and draining of the fluid, and then it will spontaneously clear itself. The eye, which we'll talk about later on in the um, chapter, also is exposed to the environment, um, but the eye is a little bit more sensitive, so there's a, a bunch of other ways that the eye can protect itself, primarily by producing tears, and then constantly blinking and washing the organs. So as far as defenses go, the biggest one for the skin is going to be the barrier defense. A barrier defense is literally just blocking the organism from gaining entry to the body. Again, this is primarily done with the epidermis, which is this keratinized skin surface. This keratinized skin surface is rough and hardy, and it's difficult for organism to get through it, okay? In fact, most pa uh, pathogens cannot penetrate the skin on their own. Instead, you need to have some sort of trauma or, or damage to the epidermal layer, okay? It's also important to note that this keratinized skin surface is constantly being renewed. So if you do have an organism that's growing on the skin, okay, on the epidermal layer, uh, all your body needs to do is produce more dead keratinized skin cells and they can just push the organism off. Chemical defenses, so you produce oil and sweat which are released on the skin surface. These make it a little bit more uh, inhospitable to microorganisms. However, there are some microorganisms that have adapted themselves to actually utilize especially oils as a food source. Okay? So sometimes these can actually make more of an infection than less. And then antimicrobial substances, so sebum, sweat, and then antimicrobial peptides. Antimicrobial peptides are just small little pieces of protein that are excreted by the body, and they primarily kill bacteria by disrupting the cell. As far as the normal biota on the skin, most of these are what we call firmicutes. 
And firmicutes are microorganisms you find in soil. Okay, so they're soil dwelling organisms. And that makes sense because your skin is being exposed to organisms in the soil all the time. Okay? Uh, the most common uh, genera of organism is going to be Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is a relatively harmless organism. However, it can be an opportunist if uh, you severely damage your epidermal layer. Okay? Uh, like you know, being a burn victim and having 50% of your epidermis burned off in one go. Other organisms you'll see there are gram-negative organisms, which are mostly the firmicutes, uh, staphylococcal organisms. And you tend to find more organisms on the skin where there's more moisture. So under the arms, in the groin region, and if you wear shoes, on your feet. So these organisms need to be relatively hardy. They need to live in dry, salty conditions. The skin is designed to be relatively dry and salty to inhibit growth. Okay? So the organisms that can live there are relatively hardy and by nature. And again, you will find more organisms in areas where there's a lot of uh, or a lot more moisture because this will uh, aid in the organisms. All right, so these are the diseases we're going to talk about today, okay? Um, <clears throat> we book breaks them up based on uh, being bacterial, followed by viral, and then we'll get into some fungal and helminth infections or protozoan infections. Now, most of the bacterial infections are going to be caused by one of two organisms, Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus pyogenes. The first uh, infection we're going to talk about in the skin is acne, and this is one of the most common skin infections. Uh, this is a relatively harmless infection to get, and that's because it's caused by a normal skin microbiota, a normal commensal, one of those propinium bacterium acne. Okay? This guy's found all over the skin, especially in hair follicles, and it's completely normal for you to have. Okay? The only time he becomes problematic is when he grows out of control. And this occurs when there's a large amount of oil being secreted in hair follicles because this is what the organism utilizes as a food source. So when you excrete more oil, let's say you're going through puberty and your body's doing all these weird things, then the organism grows uh, very quickly. This results in an immune response and a localized inflammatory response at that hair follicle. This is then what becomes that red raised pimple on your skin, which then fills up with neutrophils and becomes a whitehead. And then you pop it, relieve the pressure, and then it goes away. Okay? So this generally happens in during or during adolescence when your body is going through a lot of physiological changes and you're excreting more oil. Okay? Um, there are some people though that have oily skin by nature, and so they may get acne for a longer period of time. It is relatively easy to treat with topical antibiotics like pendomycin or uh, doxycycline. Um, but it's important to note that you have to use these antibiotics all the time, otherwise uh, they will not be effective. <coughs> um, generally speaking, it's harmless. However, it can be disfiguring, it can cause a lot of scarring, um, and can, you know, everyone's gone through acting before, it's not necessarily the best thing in the world. But generally speaking, it's not going to kill you. All right, so now we're going to focus primarily on two organisms. Uh, <coughs> Streptococcus uh, pyrogenes and Staphylococcus aureus. Okay? Uh, these two guys, depending on the virulence factors they contain, can cause many different types of infections of the skin. Okay? Also, it depends on where exactly on the skin they are and causing the infection. So the first type of infection either one of these organisms can cause is something called impetigo. And impetigo is a highly contagious uh, superficial skin infection. And it's essentially where either one of these organisms releases a toxin called the exfoliative toxin, and this causes the epidermal layer to kind of swap off. Okay? This results in a scab. The scab has got tons of bacteria in it, and if someone touches it, they then can also become infected. Okay? We see this a lot in younger children, especially in daycare settings, because they're all kind of touching each other and you know, coming into close contact. The good news is, is that it is superficial, which means it only targets the epidermal layer, so it usually does not result in scarring, and it's really easy to treat with topical antibiotics. Okay? Um, and generally, adults don't really get this too much because your immune system is well developed and can prevent it. So a little bit more about S. aureus. So you will see S. aureus pretty much uh, in every chapter throughout the rest of the semester. And that's because S. aureus is a super pathogen. It can pretty much infect any portion of the body. Okay? 
And the reason it can do this is because it has a lot of virulence factors, okay? at least the pathogenic one. It is important to note, though, that S. aureus is a commensal in most of us, about 60% of us. It's found in our upper respiratory tract, primarily in the nose. Okay? But it does not have many virulence factors when it's a commensal, so it doesn't really do you much harm. However, if it does pick up virulence factors, then it can cause a disease later on. How do we test for S. aureus? Well, the fancy way is to use a latex bead agglutination test. The reason why I call this fancy is because it gives you a result in about 30 minutes. Okay, so it's a very rapid test. The more old school traditional way is to streak out the organism on a blood auger plate and then look for beta hemolytic of uh, staphylococcal organism. So what makes this organism so pathogenic? Okay, as I mentioned before, it has a lot of virulence factors. And depending on the ones it has, the more virulent, the more pathogenic it can become. So <clears throat> there's exoenzymes the organism can contain. So hyaluronidase breaks down hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is used to keep cells together in tissues. So this can break tissues apart. Coagulase, which you guys just tested for uh, in the last lab, is an enzyme that breaks down clotting factors in blood and results in coagulation. You may ask yourself, why would the organism want to coagulate blood? It makes it difficult. I don't know. <laughs> coagulase sounds like uh, hey Siri, I guess. Um, so uh, coagulase is an enzyme. Again, it coagulates blood. And why would an organism want to do this? Well, it actually does this so it can cover itself with a clot. And when it covers itself with a clot, it then is protected from phagocytes. So it's a form of protection. Now, if it overclots, okay, so it becomes difficult for the organism to move, it then releases an exoenzyme known as staphylokinase, and staphylokinase will break down the clotting factors and allow the organism to move. Okay? So it has both of these enzymes either turn on clotting or turn off clotting. It also produces exotoxins. So remember, these are toxins that are actively released by living organisms. So toxic shock toxin is one of the most potent toxins that it produces. And this is a mimic of MHC. Okay? The way this toxin works is it will bind to all of your T cells at once and turn them all on. This results in something called cytokine storm and then eventual shock and or death. Okay? Um, and most of the women in the room, actually, oh, there's one that so the women in the room are aware of this because this is what causes toxic shock syndrome. Okay? They're wearing a tampon for too long. Exfoliative toxin. So this is a toxin that results in epidermal layers kind of breaking apart. Um, so what we saw in pedigo results in kind of a, a sloughing off of the epidermis. Uh, we'll talk about when this is uh, uh, body-wide in like a newborn uh, in a little bit. Hemolysins. These are toxins that lyse red blood cells. So if you lyse the red blood cell, you get all the goodies inside the red blood cell, but obviously this is bad for the human. And then lastly, all by itself, is a molecule known as protein A. And protein A actually binds to antibodies. So what this guy does is it will bind antibodies, stick them together, so that the antibodies are no longer effective. Okay? So when you add up all of these virulence factors together, this results in a very, very powerful pathogen. Now we can test for staph organisms using uh, the previous tests that we talked about, so uh, latex agglutination test or uh, beta hemolytic on a, a blood auger plate. And they also have these special API strips which will give you an idea of not only whether or not you have staph, <coughs> but also how resistant and what type of virulence factors it contains. Streptococcus pyrogenes, so this is the other guy that can cause a lot of uh, skin infections. Uh, a bacterial skin infection. Uh, <clears throat> this guy is uh, notorious for not only causing skin infections, but also causing sore throat. Okay? So this is the causative organism of strep throat. This guy tends to be a little bit more milder compared to S. aureus. So if you had to pick, this is the one that you'd want to be infected with. It produces both exoenzymes and exotoxins, hyaluronidase and streptokinase, which we've already kind of talked a little bit about. Uh, exotoxins, it has a super antigen, which is similar to the toxic shock toxin, but not nearly as powerful, as well as hemolysis. Okay. <clears throat> Alright, so moving on, let's talk about some other infections these two guys can cause. 
Um, so the next infection we're going to talk about is now moving away from the epidermis and going into uh, the dermis. Okay? This is an infection known as cellulitis. And this is where you have S. aureus, S. pyrogenes, or really any bacteria or fungal organism inside of the dermal layer. Okay? This results in pain, tenderness, swelling, and warmth, or inflammation in the area. Um, and it can travel relatively quickly. And the reason for that is, is you have you know, blood vessels in the area, and these guys can kind of use these as a network to move around. Uh, you'll often get lymphadenitis as well, which is an enlarged lymph node uh, near the draining uh, site. And it's important to note that <coughs> this isn't that serious of an infection. However, it is something you probably want to get treated, because if you don't get it treated with antibiotics, it can then disseminate further into areas like the subcutaneous layer or even into deep muscle tissue. A furnicle. So a furnicle is essentially an uh, infected hair follicle with S. aureus. So it's similar in uh, concept to acne, where you have a bacteria infecting a hair follicle and causing inflammation. The biggest difference with a furnicle and acne is that a furnicle is with an actual pathogen. Okay? Or with acne, it's a normal commensal. So this usually results in a much, much larger inflammatory response, and then you develop a boil. And a boil is basically just a localized infection full of pus and fluid and dead neutrophils and bacteria and all that kind of stuff. The way this gets treated is you usually lance or pop it, remove the fluid, get rid of most of the bacteria, and then take oral or um, topical antibiotics. A carbuncle. So a carbuncle is multiple <coughs> infected hair follicles. Okay, so these can be even larger and even more painful. These tend to happen primarily in areas where you have a lot of hair, so along the hairlines, as well as in the groin. Okay. Um, again, <coughs> this is treated by lancing and treating with antibiotics. Um, it is important to note, though, in some places of the body, especially in the buttocks, uh, you have a lot of thick skin there, and so this can actually, instead of growing outwards and causing a boil, can actually grow inwards. Okay? And when that happens, it can be extremely painful and usually needs to be surgically removed. Erysipelas, so this is caused by Streptococcus pyrogenes, and this is when the organism actually makes its way into the subcutaneous layer. So now we're working our way even deeper into the body, and when that happens, it causes a widespread inflammatory reaction. Okay? It looks like a, a bright red rash that forms wherever the organism is found, and it can spread very, very quickly okay, in a matter of hours. This is something that you would probably want to get treated as soon as possible. In fact, a lot of times they will um, you know, admit you to the hospital with this. So you can prevent the uh, spread of the infection in the body. Because if you don't get rid of it, it can make its way into blood vessels and then work its way further into the body, causing more serious uh, This is primarily transmitted uh, by getting a, a small break on the skin, and then the organism wiggling its way. It is important to note that most healthy individuals with a competent immune system wouldn't develop something like this. Your immune system would stop it before it got its way. Necrotizing fasciitis. So this is where you have S. aureus or S. pyrogenes, and it's now worked its way through the skin layer and now gone into deep tissue, okay? In this case, muscle in the arm. Now, once the organism gets into the, the muscle tissue, it basically just starts to grow out of control. Okay? The main reason for this is, is that it's hard for immune cells to penetrate muscle. Okay? Muscle is a very dense tissue, so the cells can easily wiggle their way in. Also, if you take antibiotics, either orally or intravenously, they also will not penetrate the muscle tissue very well. So if this goes untreated, like in this case, um, <clears throat> this will result in widespread tissue damage and destruction, and the only way to treat this is to amputate and debride. Okay? So this is where you would cut off all the dead necrosing tissue, and debridement is where you would scrape away as much of it as possible to get rid of any organism that may be there. Okay? Yes? Um, my cousin went through this uh, on her leg, and mm -hmm. she used a reason is that it was introduced into the razor. Mm -hmm. How is that even possible? Probably probably so. Yeah. So the organisms S. aureus and S. pyrogenes are really common. 
So like I said, S. aureus is found in 50 to 60 percent of us. So she may have already had it and then got it on her skin and then scraped it with the razor and then it got in that way. As pyrogenes causes strep throat. And a lot of us have gotten strep throat before. And in fact, a lot of us can actually be chronic carriers of strep throat where we no longer get symptoms, but the organism is still in our tonsils. So if she drooled on herself and then cut herself, it's possible too. So it's, it's, it's kind of weird when you think about it that way, but these bacteria are small, they're hard to see, and if you wash them away, sometimes some still stick around. Now, uh, generally speaking, healthy individuals with you know, uh, good blood flow and a competent immune system, it's difficult for them to get something like this. Okay? You usually see it in people who are immunocompromised, have poor blood flow, like di having diabetes or something, or if they just don't care about themselves at all, like an intravenous drug user. Okay? And if you're an intravenous drug user, this is seen a lot in them because they're literally taking dirty needles and injecting it into their muscle a lot of times. They're actually causing these infections through that. Process. Is that like, um, like MRSA? Like that? Um, yep, yep. So MRSA is just Staphylococcus aureus, but it's resistant to methicillin antibiotics. So in the case of MRSA, then it's even more difficult to treat because methicillin, which is a potent antibiotic, isn't going to work in that case. And then VRSA is vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is even more resistant. And that guy is almost impossible to kill. So if you get that, and this happens, you're just going to start cutting away until it's gone, which is hard. Scalded skin syndrome. This is caused by Staphylococcus aureus. And this is where um, uh, S. aureus, which is a normal commensal in the vagina in some women, is transferred to uh, the newly born child as it goes through the vaginal canal. Okay? Now, this is a normal, uh, virulent free S. aureus. Okay? However, once it gets on the baby's skin, it can go through lysogenic conversion. And this is where it gets infected with a bacteriophage that carries with it the exfoliative toxin. And because the baby has a poor immune system at this point in time, because it was newly born, uh, this toxin and organism starts to just grow like crazy, and it basically causes the epidermal layer to peel off from the baby's skin. Okay? Uh, this becomes so widespread that it's basically just all over. Um, it's basically like having a blister all over your body. Okay? The good news is, is that the baby is very, very young at this point. It's probably not going to remember this. It does, um, it is relatively easy to treat with antibiotics, topical antibiotics. But it is important to keep in mind that secondary infections can occur, and that's because you've basically gotten rid of your barrier defense at this point. Okay? So any other organism, you know, even run-of-the-mill fungal organisms that wouldn't cause disease normally, could potentially cause a problem. So in this case, you want to use a lot of topical antibiotics, antifungals, to make sure that the baby does not get infected. But it's not really life-threatening. It doesn't really cause any long-term sequelae or problems. Okay? It's just something that happens. Gas gangrene. So now we're switching from S. aureus and S. pyrogenes, and now we're going to talk about an organism known as Clostridium perfiginis. Clostridium organisms in general are anaerobic soil-dwelling organisms. Okay? Um, they are ubiquitous, which means you find them all over the place. Okay? And <clears throat> the way that people get infected with Clostridium organisms is usually through some sort of cut. Okay? So with Clostridium perfiginis, if you cut your foot, it comes into contact with soil, you don't clean it properly, and you have poor blood flow, usually because of a genetic problem or diabetes, the organism can then get into the tissue and start to grow and divide. The reason why poor blood flow is required is because blood is what contains oxygen in your body. So if you have poor blood flow, then there's low oxygen levels in the tissue, and this allows the organism to grow. It can then release exoenzymes and toxins, which then slowly start to kill the tissue. It does this because if it kills the tissue, the blood vessels will also die, and now there's no oxygen left in the tissue, and then the organism can spread. Okay? And what it does is it slowly works its way up the extremities until it gets into the core of the body, and then you're dead. Okay? <coughs> Again, this is a relatively difficult organism to treat. Um, really, the only way to treat is to amputate and debride. Okay? Um, so cutting off the infected tissue. Now the problem with that is that the organism tends to wiggle its way through living tissue as well. So it's hard to determine when to amputate. 
But what they have shown is you can use things like hyperbaric chambers, which is where you pump a lot of oxygen into the tissue, and then this can stop the growth of the organism in the healthy tissue. It's called gas gangrene because it causes gaseous tissue. Okay? And this is where you get little pockets of carbon dioxide gas that form. This is literally the carbon dioxide gas being released by the microorganisms, which you can see here in purple, and this causes kind of a spongy tissue to develop. Other bacterial infections of the skin, so Pseudomonas aeruginosa. As we mentioned before, Pseudomonas is a common commensal. It's found on the skin. It's usually harmless. However, if you, um, you know, lose a large portion of your epidermal layer, if you're a burn victim, or if you're immunocompromised, then this can become an opportunistic pathogen, and it's relatively difficult to treat because it's very, very hard. The Psyllis andrasis, which we'll talk a little bit about later, this causes something called an euchre, and a euchre is basically a large necrotic lesion in the skin that is full of black pus. Okay? Uh, this uh, is a common organism found on cows, okay, cattle, and so you usually get this when you, um, you are milking a cow with a cut on your hand. Uh, this is the most common form of anthrax. It's also the easiest one to treat. Okay? Um, usually is not life threatening if you treat it early. And then Mycobacterium leprae. So this is a mycobacterium. These are usually very slow, fastidious organisms. So this causes a very long term debilitating illness uh, known as leprosy. And leprosy is basically where the organism works its way into cooler areas of the body, usually car cartilaginous tissue slowly start to grow and divide, causing granulomas to form, and this results in disfiguration. Okay. After about 20, 30, 40 years of this, it then can work its way into the bloodstream, and then it kills you. Now let's talk about some viral infections of the skin. First viral infection of the skin is VZV, or varicella zoster virus. This is a herpes virus, very common. And that's because this is the virus that causes chicken pox. Okay. It often starts off as a respiratory uh, infection. Once it gets into the respiratory system, it will then disseminate, primarily getting into peripheral nerves. Once in the peripheral nerves, it incubates for about 10 to 12 days. And then it will travel down the nerve and kind of pop its head out, causing a pustular rash. Pustular just means it's full of liquid and it's raised up. These tend to itch, so when you itch them open, the virus then can be released and then can spread on. No, no, no. Okay. Because this is a herpes virus, once you get infected with this, you have it for the rest of your life. Okay? And that's because it becomes latent. And where it goes, becomes latent is primarily in a spinal ganglia. These are kind of a bundles of, of nerves located along the spinal cord. Okay? And wherever this organism hangs out, or whatever spinal ganglia it decides to pick, it can sit there and, and be dormant for pretty much the rest of your life. Now, in some individuals, it will potentially wake back up. And when that happens, it causes shingles. So shingles is just reactivated chicken pox. Okay. Now, <clears throat> around 1990, we developed a vaccine called the Zostavax vaccine. And this vaccine protects you from getting this infection. So anyone before or born after 1990 has probably had the chickenpox vaccine and has never had chickenpox. Okay. For all of us old people, we probably had chickenpox, and most of the time you get it as a young child. If you get it as a young child, it's mild, self-limiting, flu-like, with a rash, and goes away. However, if you get it as an adult, it can be a little bit more serious, especially in men, because it likes to target the testes. So they tend to swell very large and it's very, very So shingles is essentially a reactivation of the latent varicella vir uh, zoster virus in the uh, root ganglia. Okay. Uh, now, depending on where uh, or what uh, vertebra and what uh, ganglia the uh, organism has decided to go latent, this is what will determine where the rash will develop on the individual. So in this case, it's probably you know somewhere around C8 or so. Okay, it's wakes back up for whatever reason, travels down wherever that nerve innervates, and then causes a red painful rash. Okay? 
So unlike it being, uh, unlike chicken pox, where it's kind of itchy, not really painful, this tends to be very, very painful. And that's because it's busting open all of these uh, nerves and sensory uh, tissue. Now, again, this isn't very life-threatening. It will go away on its own. However, it can cause long-term uh, tissue damage. And this results in what we call phantom pain, which means you will have chronic pain in that area for a long period of time, at least potentially. It is uh, preventable with uh, a vaccine. It's basically the Zosta vaccine, uh, but in a higher dose. And uh, you can uh, slow down um, the progression of the disease by treating with the cyclovir early on. So this is just showing you where it you know, targets. So right here, C8, wherever that nerve innervates, it's right here, that's where the virus can pop out. Smallpox, so smallpox is caused by a virus known as variola, uh, variola major. And <clears throat> this is the only human pathogen that we have ever eradicated. It was completely eradicated from the human population in 1977. Now the reason why we were able to eradicate this particular pathogen and no other pathogens is because <clears throat> the vaccine worked very, very well, and the vaccine was also the first vaccine to be developed. It was discovered in the late uh, 1800s. Also, it's very easy to tell when someone has smallpox, as you can see here, so you can quarantine them and prevent the spread of the infection. It's a good thing that we did eradicate it because it resulted in a high fever, blistering rash, and about a 50% mortality rate. Okay, so it was a very deadly virus. Um, but it is completely gone out of the human population. It is important to note, though, that the virus is not completely gone on Earth. Though. We do have stores of smallpox, both in the United States and in Russia. Okay. Uh, why exactly, I don't know, but we have that. The way that this was uh, vaccinated was using a similar virus known as vaccinia. This is the cowpox virus. This causes a, uh, a smallpox-like infection in cattle. And <clears throat> if you get infected with it as a human, it doesn't result in a serious infection, but it does give you immunity. Okay? So the guy who discovered this in the late 1800s, what he did is he took cowpox, well, um, from a cow, and he injected it into his five-year-old son. The son didn't get smallpox, but he did get protected from it, and then this is what uh, allowed for not only the discovery of the smallpox vaccine, but vaccination as a whole. So this is just showing you the difference between chickenpox and smallpox. They tend to look fairly similar, except smallpox is much larger, kind of hard and rubbery in, in appearance. Also, since no humans get smallpox anymore, at least not in current time, uh, if you see someone, it's probably going to be chickenpox. All right, so now we're going to move on to the macropapular rashes. Macropapular rashes are kind of flat rashes that are red in appearance. Okay, so there's not really much raising that develops. It's just kind of a red, splotchy-like appearance. Measles. So measles is caused by a virus known as rubiola, and this is the most communicable uh, infection that we know of. Okay? It's very, very, very easy to spread. You need only one viral particle for someone to become infected. It only targets humans, and its telltale symptom is something called a coplic spot, which is basically a red macropapular rash that forms on the neck and on the shoulder. It generally causes a mild flu-like illness with a red rash. However, if you are really young, okay, so under the age of two, uh, measles can be life-threatening, and it can also result in a latent infection that wakes up later in life and targets the brain, and this can result in death. Okay? This is known as subacute sclerosis panencephalitis, and this is essentially measles that wakes up 20, 30, 40 years later and can cause coma. So to prevent this, we have the MMR vaccine. MMR stands for measles, mumps, and rubella. This protects people from getting measles. And <clears throat> this also then protects very young children who have not been vaccinated yet from getting measles um, because those are the ones that are most vulnerable for the deadly variety uh, or version of it. Thank you.
rubella, also known as German measles. Um, it's called German measles because it looks very, very similar to measles, however, it's much milder. Okay? So this one is almost never life-threatening, it's always self-resolving, and you, know, you get over it no problem. However, if you are pregnant, this virus is known to uh, cross the placenta, and it tends to be teratogenic, which essentially means it causes deformities in the unborn child. It happens during the first trimester, it usually results in spontaneous abortion. If it happens in the second or third trimester, it results in severe curvature of the spine, as well as mental retardation. <clears throat> this is a baby born with rubella. Okay? You can see the severe curvature of the spine, a red rash all over the body, and probably mental retardation, but I can't tell from this picture. Now, there is a vaccine against this guy as well. This is, again, the MMR vaccine, R stands for rubella. And <clears throat> again, we use this vaccine not necessarily to protect adults or children even, because it doesn't really harm them too much, but it's primarily there to protect pregnant women. Okay? Um, so if you vaccinate everyone, uh, pregnant women will also be protected, and this will prevent it from being a transfer, transferred to an unborn child. Fist disease, so caused by erythemia infectiosum, which is another virus. This is a very mild infection, tends to happen in young children, and it causes a, a kind of red, blotchy rash that forms on the cheeks. Um, it looks like just they're hot or flush, and a low grade fever with malaise. A lot of times this happens in children, and parents don't even realize it. That's how mild it is. Roseola. So roseola is another relatively common uh, viral infection in young uh, children, especially babies. It causes a high-grade fever with a red rash, and this fever will then go away on the fourth day with no treatment, and then the baby is fine. Okay. Again, relatively common, not that serious uh, of a disease. Scarlet fever. So scarlet fever is what can occur if you have strep throat for a long period of time. So as I mentioned before, strep throat is caused by streptococcus uh, pyrogenes, except instead of being on the skin, it's in the throat itself. And <clears throat> scarlet fever occurs when you have a strep throat infection for, you know, a couple weeks. Uh, the organism can release a hemolysin toxin. This can then work its way to the bloodstream. This lyses red blood cells, and this is what results in scarlet fever. It's a red rash that forms all over the body and a high-grade fever. It's not very serious or life-threatening, but it does tell you that you probably should go get tested for strep throat and get it treated. Because if you don't, the organism can then work its way into the bloodstream and cause things like rheumatic fever or glomerular nephritis and destroy your kidneys. Um, so it is kind of a good warning sign to say, hey, go do something. Get treated. Warts. So warts are caused by the papillomavirus. Okay, or HPV, human papillomavirus. There are hundreds of serotypes of HPV. Serotypes are just different flavors of the virus. Okay? Most of these serotypes do absolutely nothing. Okay? And most of us have been infected with HPV at least some point in our life. Some of these serotypes can cause warts, which are benign skin growths. This is just where your epidermal layer grows faster in one area than the rest of the body. This is very, it's harmless, it's, it's benign, so it's not cancerous, it's not going to spread and cause you no know, more problems elsewhere. <clears throat> it's transmitted through direct contact. It's important to note that it needs to actually get through the epidermis for an infection to occur. So you need to have some sort of scrape, abrasion, or microtrauma to develop okay, for this organism. Now, it's relatively easy to treat as far as uh, warts are concerned. All you need to do is kind of stimulate the immune response in the area. The immune system will come in and clear the virus, and then it will go away. We do this by using like acids, like salicylic acid, um, immune stimuli like amiquamod, but we can also just burn the skin using really cold stuff like liquid nitrogen or carbon dioxide, and this will again stimulate the immune response. Even if you don't treat it, it usually goes away on its own. However, in some individuals, it can spread and it can be difficult to get rid of. Now, there are some flavors or serotypes of HPV. 
uh, primarily 16, 18, 31, 35, that can cause uh, cancer, okay? But these are relatively rare, and they need to occur at very specific junctions of skin tissue, okay? So where you would see something like this would be in the cervix, in the anus, uh, canal tissue, and in the throat, okay? But again, uh, it's relatively rare anymore because we can prevent this uh, by, you know, screening and things. Leishmaniasis. So leishmaniasis is a protozoan infection. And leishmaniasis is found primarily in South America. It's transmitted via a, a, a blood-sucking insect known as a sand fly. Sand flies bite humans, they get a blood meal, and when they do this, they can inject the leishmania organism into blood. This then gets phagocytosed by macrophages. And instead of being destroyed by the macrophage, the least meaning organism actually lives inside of the macrophage. This macrophage then goes into tissues, like macrophages are designed to do, and they like to hang out primarily in cartilaginous tissue. So you see these a lot around the nose uh, and the ears. Once this happens, you develop cutaneous leishmaniasis. Your immune system responds to that infected macrophage, and it causes a big kind of open, rubbery sore to form in these tissues. This then occurs for a long period of time, usually decades, until eventually the organism works its way into the lymphatic system. This is known as suspendia. And then from there, it can go into the systemic system or the bloodstream. This is systemic leishmaniasis. And this then usually results in death. Okay? It is relatively easy to treat with antihelminthics. However, the place where this is endemic are areas of the world where it's sometimes hard to come by uh, proper medication. Cutaneous anthrax. So cutaneous anthrax is caused by a bacterium known as Bacillus anthracis. This is, again, a commensal found on cows. Um, and we can become infected with it through the skin if we have a break in the skin area. Okay? Once the organism gets in, it causes a black necrotic lesion known as a euchre, and this then uh, can disseminate into the bloodstream and result in potential death. Okay? However, it is relatively easy to treat if you catch it early on, um, and uh, it doesn't really kill too many people anymore thanks to the advent of antibiotics. And we don't really have many monkeys anymore. Leishmaniasis. So this is what it would look like. It's kind of a large, kind of hard, rubbery nodule that forms. It's basically an open granuloma on the skin. And then over here, we have cutaneous anthrax. You can tell the difference pretty easily because this guy is black. It's full of black necrotic pus. You can actually test for this by sucking out the pus, and you'll see it is dark black in color. All right, so now on to fungal infections of the skin. So fungal infections of the skin are relatively common, okay? And that's because these fun uh, particular fungal organisms listed here are what we call dermatophytes. They actually can use keratin as a food source. So normally the keratin in our epidermis is designed to protect us from pathogen. In this case, it's actually acting as food for pathogen to grow. Okay. We often call these ringworm. However, it's important to note they are not worms. They are fungal organisms. We call them ringworm because they tend to form little rings on the skin. Now we don't really talk about the actual species of fungal organisms, and that's because there's a, a whole bunch of them and they all kind of do the same thing. Instead we talk about where it actually occurs on the body. And tinea is the fancy name for ringworm, okay? And so if you see tinea followed by another word that tells you that it's a fungal infection of the skin, and the other word tells you where on the body. So tinea corporis is on the smooth skin, tinea pettis is on the foot, tinea capatis is on the scalp, tinea barbae is in the beard, tinea gyne is in the nails, and tinea cruce is in the groin. Okay? Uh, the two most common are probably going to be tinea pettis, known as athlete's feet, and then uh, tinea cruce, which is known as jock itch. Over here, you can see uh, tinea uh, corporis, which is essentially on smooth skin. Again, this is, or, or this is someone who is um, probably immunocompromised, because you can see it's a very kind of nasty infection. This is not something you would see in a normal healthy individual. Most tinea infections in a healthy, normal uh, individual with you know, a competent immune system 
are going to be kind of mild burning itchiness, uh, and it's usually readily treatable. When it becomes this widespread, this tells you there's something else going on, some other underlying condition. So this is tinea clotis, which is on the scalp. Okay, uh, this happens a lot in newborns. This is known as cradle calf. Um, it can happen in adults. Usually, though, it causes just a mild dander to form. Okay. Um, however, in severe cases like this, again, this is probably someone that's immunocompromised. It can actually start to weaken the tissue and cause balding. Tinea pedis, so this is at its feet. Again, this is not a normal situation. Uh, I'm sure you know a lot of you have had aptitude before. It causes a mild burning-like rash on the skin, okay, on the foot. This case is someone who is you know immunocompromised, or maybe has poor blood flow, they're diabetic or something, and you can see it's kind of widespread. Tinea eugynum, so this is uh, tinea of the nails. Uh, the nails themselves are really just a whole bunch of keratin. So the organism can actually work its way into the keratin layers of the nail and then live inside of there. Okay? This causes the nail to flake off, as you can see here, and then it becomes very, very, very difficult to treat. Okay? You take oral antifungal uh, organ or oral antifungal compounds, it's not going to penetrate the nail because the nail is essentially dead. And if you use topical antifungal compounds, it won't penetrate because they actually live within the layers. Okay? So this is one of the hardest things to treat. And I love how the picture they get is from 1965. Okay, so enough of the skin. Now let's move on to the eye. Okay? Good news for us is the eye doesn't really get infected that often. Okay? And that's because the eye is relatively well protected by the body. The eye itself is constantly exposed okay, because it is open, and that's what you can see. And the exposed surfaces are primarily the conjunctiva and the cornea. And both of these may potentially get infected. Okay. The conjunctiva is a thin mucous membrane layer that covers the sclera or the white portion of the eye. And the cornea is a dome-shaped clear lens it doesn't really magnify, but it acts as kind of a barrier to prevent other things from getting into the interior portion of the eye. So this is what it looks like. So here you can see the conjunctiva, which is this small, thin mucous membrane layer that covers the sclera, or the white portion of the eye. And then up here you can see the cornea, which is this kind of, you know, uh, transparent lens uh, that is exposed to the environment and could potentially become infected. So how does our body prevent these infections? Well, blinking works pretty well. So whenever an organism gets into the eye, all you do is you blink, and this washes it away. Okay? If it can't stay in one spot, then it's not going to cause disease. Tears aid in the bleeding, so having some sort of liquid lubricant to move things around. And then also the production of lysozyme, which is an enzyme that kills bacteria. As far as normal biota of the eye, there really shouldn't be much. Okay, you may have some staphylococcal organisms, but generally speaking, it's pretty sparse. Now, the first type of uh, infectious disease that can occur in the eye is something called conjunctivitis. Okay? Conjunctivitis is inflammation of the conjunctiva. Okay? And <clears throat> again, the conjunctiva is a thin mucous membrane layer covering the eye. Now, in a you know, healthy adult or even a, a young child that has an immune system, uh, this really doesn't result in that serious of an infection. It's usually what we consider pink eye. Okay? So this is where you have mild kind of inflammation on the outside portion of the eye. It makes your eye a little scratchy. It gets a little inflamed. Um, but all in all, it's really not that big of a deal. However, if you are a neonate or newly born child, okay, uh, you can pick up bacterial organisms from the mom's vagina, primarily Chlamydia trichomonas and Neisseria gonorrhea, both of which are sexually transmitted organisms. These then can work their way into the conjunctiva. They then grow out of control because the baby really doesn't have an immune response. This results in severe scarring and then blindness. Okay? Um, in first world countries like ours, you get screened for Chlamydia and Neisseria as your prenatal care. Um, and if you have that, you get treated before you have birth, or you have a cesarean. 
Also, uh, all newborns that are born in the United States get a couple drops of antibiotic uh, ointment, and this will then prevent this from occurring. But in countries where this can be hard to come by, we still see a lot of neonatal blindness. Like this. this is the number one cause of neonatal blindness. Trachoma. So trachoma is basically a chlamydial infection in the eye, okay, in an adult. Okay, so no longer in a neonate, now in an adult. Now, we don't really see this too often because you have to be infected with chlamydia for very, very, very long periods of time for this adult. Okay? Um, usually it's treated before that because there's many other symptoms that develop before it gets this bad. Okay? The organism works its way into the lymphatic system and then target the eye. This results in severe scarring of the eyelid, which then scratches the conjunctiva, resulting in inflammation and an eventual blindness. It is treatable with antibiotics, um, so we don't, again, see this in places where antibiotics are readily available, but if antibiotics are hard to come by, then this does uh, occur occasionally. Keratitis. So keratitis is when you have inflammation of the cornea. This results in scarring. Okay? When you have enough scarring of the cornea, you then can become blind. Okay? The two main causes of keratitis are going to be herpes keratitis, which is a relatively rare uh, herpes infection, or anthiomoeba. Anthiomoeba is an amoeboid organism that lives as a free-living guy, living primarily in fresh water. Um, but occasionally, it can get in your eye if you wear dirty contacts. And this is why you have to change your contacts every couple weeks and wash your contacts if they get dirty. Uh, there was a, a case where a girl wore disposable contacts for a year without changing them and she got anthiomoeba. Uh, the organism can you know, come in through literally anywhere, it's an environmental organism, and when it's under your contact, it then is close proximity to the cornea, can actually irritate it and then result in that. But again, these are relatively rare if you wash your contacts, uh, and you have a healthy immune system, these are things that we see in, in most people. And then lastly, we're going to talk about river blindness. So river blindness is a parasitic infection, okay, and it's caused by a man, that can result in potential blindness. Uh, its fancy name is onchocoriasis, okay, and that's because it's caused by onchocria of vulvus. This is transmitted by black flies. Okay, these aren't the same black flies we have. These are a particular species of fly found in sub-Saharan Africa. These flies basically reproduce in uh, moving streams. And sub-Saharan Africa is very dry. And so you see a lot of people living by these streams to irrigate their crops. What that means is wherever you have people, you have black flies. And the black fly can then bite, take a blood meal, inject in the Oncoria organism. Once the organism is in the bloodstream, the larva form of the organism grows very, very, very rapidly to the point where you find it pretty much everywhere in the body. The way you test for onchocriasis is you take a hypodermic needle, you pull up a little bit on the skin, snip the skin, sounds like it hurts, but it doesn't. Put that little skin snipping on a slide, add some PBS, and you'll actually see worms wiggling out of the skin. The reason why the organism does this is because it's hoping that a black fly will come bite you, and then when it does, it gets some of the worms from the skin, and then goes off and infects another person. Now, <clears throat> because this organism is so prevalent in the body, it can literally, literally just kind of go everywhere. And one place it likes to go is the back of the eye, where the retina is, and oftentimes it will detach the retina. Okay? Um, <clears throat> in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 20 years ago, this was a very serious problem. Uh, got to the point where pretty much everyone over the age of 30 would be blind uh, because of this. The good news is, is that Bill and Melinda Gates, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, has um, you know, put a lot of money into eradicating this. And it's relatively easy to do. There are anti homentic drugs. You take low doses of them. And this then kills off the organism before it gets to that level. Okay. Um, because of them, this is almost eradicated. So they're thinking this may be the second human pathogen that we eradicate. Which is good news because permanent blindness is not a fun thing to have, especially in sub-Saharan Africa when you're a farmer. All right, that's it for chapter 18. Any questions? 
Alright, I'll see you guys on Thursday.